Welcome to the Mom and Dot 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 Podcasts. We're your hosts, Suzanne Kern and Missy Stevens. We want to help you through everything that happens in the ellipses, from your professional life to your emotional health. You're a mom and so much more. Let's figure out what comes next together. Welcome to the Mom and Dot 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 Podcast. I'm Missy Stevens, mom and dot 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 writer, foster child advocate, and this week election nail biter. It'll be over by the time this airs, but I've, I've got currently, my better shirt on. I got for my you. Shirt. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Currently feel a little nauseated. I know. <laughs> and I'm Suzanne Kearns, mom and dot 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 writer, LGBTQ and sex ed advocate. And today, officially 50 years old. And one day, it wasn't as painful as it seems, Missy, I swear. <laughs> and this week, we are so excited to be chatting with Ashley Rechtenwald. Ashley is a mom and dot, dot, dot co-host of the Motherhood and Career Collide podcast, founder of Working Mom Notes and a physician associate. Ashley uses Instagram to shed light on the day-to-day struggles and triumphs of working mothers, such as salary gaps, work travels, maternity leave rights, and how to set boundaries both professionally and personally. Ashley has a Bachelor of Science in Athletic Training and Biology. She worked in Manhattan for a physical therapy company as an athletic trainer performing sports medicine rehabilitation. She then went on to graduate school and received a Bachelor of Science in Health Sciences and a Master of Science in Physical Assistant Studies. She is a physician associate with a specialty in orthopedics and sports medicine. And anybody who's been listening to us the past month or so knows that my my artist daughter has decided that she wants to become a physical therapist. And I promise that's not the only reason we wanted to have you on. So that I could pick your brain about that career path. <laughs> sure. We'll do our podcast. And then Suzanne has a list of questions. Yes, for you. I have a list of questions for my daughter's degree. <laughs> uh, Ashley lives in New Jersey and is married and a mother of three girls and currently spends her days focusing on working mom notes and advocating for working women nationwide. Welcome. We are Welcome. so happy to have you here. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, we are really excited to talk to you about motherhood and career because those two things totally collided for both of us. And motherhood won the battle in both of our cases. And we stayed home for a long time. In one case, now 17 plus years. In my case, 15, 16 years now, I guess. So we heard a bit about your career in your bio and what you did before this. But what was the impetus to be where you are now? Oh, my gosh. It was like an atomic explosion. (laughs) (laughs) When you have babies. Um, I was in a very, very fast paced orthopedic practice working for an orthopedic surgeon. So I spent half my time in the operating room and half my time in the clinic seeing patients and treating sports medicine injuries. So it is not a remote position by any means. It is not Mm -hmm. a full position Mm -hmm. at all, ever. Um, when you call out you are out for the day and that was never a problem for me until I had children. (laughs) I was okay. Technically, I was reliable. But children, as we all know, are not as predictable. And um, my husband worked, works still a very demanding job in construction, where similarly, he cannot work remotely. He needs Mm -hmm. to be on site. So we found ourselves in a predicament where we had a wonderful childcare situation. However, it just wasn't really enough to bridge the gap. And Mm -hmm. child one was fine. Child two was okay. But then come child three, I really was wearing thin. And it was a lot to juggle. And I was getting frustrated at work. Work was getting frustrated with me. Mm-hmm. And it was, it just ended up becoming a very toxic work environment. And it mm-hmm. was at the peak of when um, the pandemic hit. Oh. And my baby was four months old. And I oh, said, wow. forget it. I am not going into a hospital with a four month old, a two year old, and a four year old. Yeah. So mm-hmm. goodbye. And I resigned. And I luckily had had working mom notes on the side all along and said, you know, this is a great opportunity to dive full time into this. My husband supported that decision. He agreed. He did not want me in healthcare at the moment. Um, Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did. And now here we are two years later 
And I sort of hit my stride in a, you know, true work from home, flexible position where I can be there for my children, yet also still feel fulfilled professionally. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. So are you doing any of the physical therapy stuff now or is it everything, the working mom notes? It's everything working mom notes. It was like a 180 degree career pivot. I'm keeping all my certifications up to date and I'm not completely wiping the slate of healthcare. But as I'm sure you'll be interested to know, healthcare these days, have it's just changed so, so much. Yeah, I've had and it is very stressful and mm-hmm. patient care in and of itself is very draining. And mm-hmm. so to have three young children and then go into an environment that tends to be very draining itself, mm-hmm. it, it's just not a place I want to a position I want to put myself in at this Mm -hmm. moment in time. I think there is a time and a place for it, but not necessarily for me and my temperament when I'm raising little children. I want all of that emotional energy directed towards them, not towards healing and caring for others as well. Right. Yeah. That's a lot of giving and giving. And, and giving and giving and giving. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And trouble it all right yeah. out of you. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, well, then let's jump to just talking about Working Mom Notes then. Sure. So yeah. I created Working Mom Notes um, right after my first baby was born. It started as a Facebook group, a local Facebook group to my area because I had so many questions. This was seven years ago. So it the motherhood space didn't look like how it looks today there was nothing there was absolutely i googled everything i possibly could about how to support myself and my baby as i returned to work and i couldn't find anything and i said okay well why don't i create a space just in my area so i can meet people and find out how to do this thing whether it be what do i do with my breast milk when i'm done pumping how do i have that conversation at, at work about pumping at work and taking mm. those breaks right um you know how do i make mom friends all of these questions and i was hoping to meet maybe 10 women or have 10 women join my group in order to create this network and bounce questions off of and now we're thousands strong just locally within this area so it branched out to you know local mom happy hours and really has created a community of working women here. And I thought, well, if we needed it here within our community, people must need it elsewhere too. Yeah. Right. When I pushed over to Instagram and it's just been history from there, just shedding light on what it's like to be a working mom. Um, I've taken a real turn, especially with three girls, talking a lot about advocacy, um, mm-hmm. especially with the current state of politics. Yep. Um, Which is hit or miss on my page, but, you know, working motherhood is political and it is what it is. So, you know, I just try to stay true to myself on the page and inform everyone as best I can using that science degree and just masters in not research itself, but understanding how to research properly and really streamline that information for people. Yeah. And we love how you have stayed true to yourself. I mean, you really do. You're not trying yes. to make it this like, oh, I'm going to play both sides or you know, I'm just going to try to make sure everybody's happy. It's like, no, this is what I believe. So let me share this with you. Thank well, you. And I think that idea that motherhood is political, we don't, we never should have had the luxury, but we, I think, got complacent for a while and thought, well, I don't want to be political was a thing a lot of people said. Yeah. I don't think we have that anymore. We should not have that. It's all political. Mm hmm. The situation we're in now has made it that it is all political. We should not be having to vote on things that we are voting on, but yeah. women's rights are being taken away. So it's something we have to think about. So yeah, um, it's important to have people who can boil down the science behind it and talk about it from an educated standpoint. And I think for me, politics has always been a very uncomfortable topic. And mm-hmm. that's all the more reason I want to talk about it because I'm trying to normalize it for myself as well. Yes. Like, I actually don't like talking about it. If someone tried to debate any type of political topic with me, I would not be pleased. And nope. I don't think that comes across on my page, but it's because I'm forcing myself 
to do my own work, do my own research so that I can come to a decision and present that information in a way that makes sense. I mean, is that biased? Maybe, but I'm trying to give a perspective that at least makes sense to me coming from a place that is not political. It, I don't have a history of parents talking politics at the mm-hmm. dinner table. Right. And so it's like I'm teaching myself how to be political. And that's also mm-hmm. why I love keeping the conversations open and having that open discussion or debate on my page because I want to hear other perspectives. I'm not saying my way is the way. I'd love to hear what other people have to say about anything. And I'm always open-minded. And I do have a history of whether it be editing the way I caption something or changing a post or pinning something that is completely different from my opinion, but it's such a good point. I think is unique to the social media space because most Mm -hmm. people are just really willing to double down on what they have to say instead of being more open to all these different nuanced perspectives. How is that received on the page? Do people stick around even if they're not happy with it? Have you have people Mm -hmm. made a stink about it? Like how how has that gone? And you get a little bit of everything. Um, I for the most part, I don't lose people from it. It has to be really divisive. Um, I've lost people over a few posts, but it actually had to do more about vaccine than about politics. And it was really, it wasn't, in my opinion, it wasn't a divisive post. It was very straightforward scientific information, Mm -hmm. but the vaccine conversation has become so polarizing Mm -hmm. that people just, their bodies just shut off. And I think they're, they're just not willing to or not wanting to, it's not that they're not, right. they're just exhausted. They're like, I don't want to see this. I don't want to look at that. But generally speaking, the divisive conversations on my page go really well. I hear a lot of people on Instagram getting, you know, the quote unquote trolls and yeah. these people just saying the meanest things. It is so rare for me to receive that type of feedback and DMs from people. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing um, because am I not being divisive enough? Who knows? (laughs) But Maybe they respect you enough not to do it. (laughs) Yes. I've had people literally unfollow me and then refollow me, you know, just because I will reach out to them and say, listen, I understand that upset you, but it's not meant to be personal or also taking into account. Sometimes people just have a bad day and they're looking to take it out on someone somewhere. Yeah. And if you think about it that way, too, again, it's not personal. It's not a personal attack at me. And I try to run the page that way where I them account. They're just, you know, building that moat and they're they're going to defend that that statement, whatever it may be, which is one way to do it. I I just have a different approach. And now it's it's interesting because you run that by yourself, correct? They're okay. working on notes. And but then yeah. you partner together uh, with Kimberly to do your podcast, which correct. obviously Missy and I have a soft spot in our heart for <laughs> moms doing podcasts together. Yes. And we're gonna actually be hopefully interviewing her soon. So we're that we're airing these episodes close together. Uh, but since you do both, you come together for this, but then you also have your separate things that you do. Um, right. How did you come together for the podcast and uh, where did that bloom out of? We met through the motherhood space on Instagram. I actually, when our accounts were both very, very young, um, about two years ago, two and a half a bit at this point, um, it was before the pandemic, I reached out to her because I just loved what she was doing. And so I just cold messaged her and said, hey, I'm Ashley. I, I love what you're doing. I'd love to hear more. I'd love to support you in any way I can. I'd really love to connect. And we just hit it off. It was yeah. like a blind date. And we started, <laughs> you know, DMing more back and forth about ideas about motherhood. And then, you know, we called each other and all of a sudden we're talking for like 45 minutes and the next thing you know she approached me and said I've been really dying to do a podcast and you know I'd really love to co-host it with you and I was really reluctant I I said oh I don't know um but she convinced me and I'm so glad she did because she just had such a smart spin and it was all her she really wanted to talk about motherhood and career but have it be 
backed by research that we could actually talk about, not just going back and forth. So we reference articles within our podcast about the conversations that we're talking about so that we can back that information in a way that can validate our discussion and how women are feeling out there who are listening to us. I love that. Do y'all divide the work? Like, or is one of you more the researcher and more, or how do you do that? We usually both try to pull at least one article. And then that's like the article we focus on that we know best that we're referencing as we talk about whatever our topic is for that day. I love that. It's so cool. And it's such a fun podcast. And that's so fun to, to know that it's only been a couple of years that you guys have been together because it seems like you've been friends forever. And we've never met in person. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, wow. So cool. I, I know. love that. I know. It, we're so sad about it, but she lives in California and I live in New Jersey. Yeah. We've never met in person. We've only oh my. And for a chunk of your relationship, it was COVID. Yeah, yeah so. exactly. Yeah. So we see each other every week on Zoom. We talk. Several times a week, we use Boxer. It's sort of like uh-huh. a talkie back and forth. Yes. Um, and that's how our friendship has been. So it'll be quite a day when we finally get to meet. That will be so special. Yes. Oh you need gosh. a retreat. Yes, you're right. We do. So I'm guessing you have, from all the articles that you're pulling, started to see some trends of like, what are the biggest struggles that working moms or moms are facing these days? And What are you seeing, or at least what are the articles that you're gravitating towards? Yeah, so there's the top three. There's paid leave, there's child care, and there's there's flexibility in the workplace. I mean, without a doubt, those three things make it so challenging for working mothers, especially young working mothers, to get back to work and thrive. Yeah, I saw something just the other day about it was a comment on a, on an article about childcare, the cost of childcare. And the mm-hmm. person had commented, don't breed them if you can't feed them. I don't care about your kids. Oh, geez. Yeah. And I thought that's someone who said the inside thing out loud or typed it out right. loud. Right. But this, it was a guy. Of course, it was a guy. <laughs> this guy is not the only one thinking that. And it was horrifying to me Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. people can't see beyond their own little sphere to think what would what would the impact be on the greater world if child care did not cost an entire person's salary. Right. And honestly, that's coming from such a place of, I mean, honestly, just being naive and ignorant because we're one of the only countries in the world that doesn't have these services available to us. And it's really, and it shows. <laughs> it shows. Yes, it very <laughs> much shows. Comments like that. And honestly, I would say to that person, like how many parents are in the United States ratio wise to childless people? Mm-hmm. And I would say we, we outdo the numbers. I don't know the numbers, but I'd be interested to know what that is. Yeah. Um, and so that in of itself, numbers wise, you know, we need that support. We are, I would believe, the mi- majority of the country. And you would well, think what that would should do? come through with voting. Like, even though this episode's not going to air until after Election Day, as we are chatting now, I'm sitting with my Beto shirt. We are tomorrow is November 8th tomorrow. Um, as we are recording this. And right before this midterm election, huge consequences for women democracy like the future of the world that's it but there's so many other things that come with that on the ballot as far as you know paid family leave and reproductive right what are the legislative issues that you think we do have the most ability to impact now like what what should we all be out there fighting for and making sure that we're paying attention to on the next election i I mean reproductive rights is, is by far I think number one, I think paid leave is a close number two. And they are ironically a little bit hand in hand because it's dealing with pregnancy. And ultimately, I am hopeful that for this election, it's firing up enough women to get out there and, and have, I mean, everyone has an opinion, but I think sometimes people get complacent in voting like, oh, Mm -hmm. my seat you know, blue. So it's fine. I'm not getting out there. Or I'm a red state, but 
my my blue vote won't matter or vice versa let's mm-hmm. say you, you know so i think this time it's like really game on and people feel that and they're they're getting competitive in more of like a sports nature like never before <laughs> like i want my team to win yeah mm-hmm. and i think that's a good thing because it's getting all of these really important issues that people took for granted or that have people have always wanted that they just were accepting that we just could not quote unquote couldn't do um it's getting it on the radar especially for younger generations i mean the the numbers are shocking to me how many young folks are out there voting right now i mean the stats are higher than they've ever been in history and that is really I'm hoping good to see. We'll see what the outcome is, but I'm hoping that's a good thing. Yeah. I Our early voting so numbers are not looking so hot in Texas they right now. Again. I'm so stunned. nervous. Yeah. I'm stunned. I know. I'm hoping that there's this weird subliminal thing. Part of me is like, are there just a bunch of Democrats who are like, okay, fine. If you're going to question the data, if we have this ahead we'll of time, vote on the day of. people, I'm going to vote on the day of. But I don't think that I don't think we're sophisticated enough to know that. <laughs> I, I think, think we're so. just yeah. I think we're just it's, giving up and tired and lazy. I think unfortunately it's it's going. mind blowing to me yeah. that I mean it, voting's hard mm-hmm. for a lot of people. It's hard to find the time. So if there is over a week of time that mm-hmm. it's flexible and the lines aren't as long, why wouldn't you take advantage yeah. of that instead of waiting until tomorrow to stand in what is potentially a very long line? Yeah, um, and some but, states will offer you up to between two and four hours of paid leave for through your employer. Yeah, so that's yeah. something to look into for your state. It, our school district has a day off yeah. tomorrow, so but I heard the teachers so cool. have to be there. Did you so hear that? What? Yes. What's the point? What <laughs> our district? We're in two different districts. Ours is not closed, but I think it is brilliant that your school district is. So I'm hoping. That even though the teachers have to report to school, that they are given a block of time to leave and go. Vote. I've got to think they are. Because if, otherwise, why take the day? Because really, what you're doing is just burdening parents <laughs> who might have had time to vote, but now <laughs> their children are home. So like, right. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, it was good intentions. It was totally yeah. good intentions. Yeah. The road to hell, baby. The road to hell paved with a. But no, that is probably like a small thing as far as like what can listeners do, like. Ask your HR, ask your yeah. uh, your company, what is the policy? Like, you even, can't ask HR, you have to tell HR. That's, <laughs> that's true. That's an, yeah. Here's what I think it should be. Or no, here's what it is. Here's and it I is. have this right and I need to, uh, I'm going to take this time. I'm going to take it and yeah. I'm not going to get in trouble. Unless you live in Texas and then you have to be like, we have no rights. Can we please <laughs> have can I please leave for lunch and vote? I mean, it's here. Less than a day, sir. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I worked for a very small, you know, medical practice. And so mm-hmm. me saying this, I don't think I would ever have the ball to actually do that <laughs> in a small company. But I, if you work for a large corporation, yeah. you have actually more wiggle room. A little that. more wiggle room. Yeah. yeah. It, kind of one of the things we wanted to talk about is how do we fight for some of the things that we need? Women do face discrimination in the workplace. How do we educate ourselves so we even know how to advocate for more transparency and more equality instead of just feeling angry? Yeah. What and do telling we need each to other our salaries do? over in the break room? Right. 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 <laughs> I know. I found that that's the most challenging part is getting out of the echo chamber because we are all mm-hmm. just venting to each other and Mm -hmm. no one else seems to really care. And that's the hardest thing. And I really think arming ourselves with the knowledge and the numbers through great organizations that are doing the work, such as New America and leanin.org, they come out with some wonderful reports each year that really just blow my mind. And if you bring that to any employer in any form, It's undeniable. I mean, the stats are there. The research is solid and they can't say that it's not true and not happening. And you can say, I feel like this is happening in my workplace and they give you solutions. These are the things that need to happen. You bring that right to managers. These are the things I would like to see happen here. I think it's so important for the diversity, equity and inclusion aspect of this. You know, the burden always falls on the marginalized people the oppressed people in that position so equity is falling on the women diversity is falling on BIPOC community 
um, LGBTQ plus community. It's not fair. Mm -hmm. And if we can find a way to bring everybody in um, to that conversation and into those meetings, I think that would make such a huge difference. Again, easier said than done, but I think the numbers behind these organizations supporting it. And if you have leadership that really cares in making a difference, they will see in those reports that their bottom line is going to grow. It's going to actually, they're going to be profitable by doing these things. Mm -hmm. And so if, I think ultimately we can think, quote unquote, like a man that mm -hmm. will help say, listen, I can make you more profitable and this is how. And then bring all of that information to them. Because that's what talks. Yeah. Bottom line. <laughs> yeah. And well, and just even having the data. So it's not just mm -hmm. me, 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 or it's not my right. opinion. It's not how I feel or whatever. It's like, right. you know, this is actual data. In fact, that's mm -hmm. just yeah. so powerful. Yes. Yes. One of the things that I really want to get to, and it's something we talked to multiple guests about, but I don't think we can talk about it enough. A lot of our listeners are people who have been home for a long time. That's what really started this podcast for us. Mm -hmm. And they're ready to go out there and start looking for a job. What do you recommend? Where do they start? Do you have any favorite resources? Like, do you, is there a go-to place you send people over and over? Yes. Yes, there is. Um, there is a wonderful, wonderful company called Prowess Project. Oh, Keep we love Prowess. Her name is Ashley as well. Oh, yes. W-E-S-S Project. Um, Texan girl, correct? Yes. And in yeah. fact, we've had an episode with her. So we'll oh, make sure to we'll link to it in the show notes. Yes. Yeah. I love, love her. Um, it is a great program. Incredible technology to match women with companies that will really suit them. On top of the training that she helps to return women back to the workforce, I I just think it's so, it's just priceless what she's doing. It's really wonderful work. Um, I would say look into that. I would say start networking. I would also, you know, we are in a time right now, it's, it's wild and it, it, it's wonderful that you can pivot. I mean, no matter what your college degree is, or not, if you don't have a college degree, whatever your training is, your background, you're not cornered into going back there, especially as a mom. I mean, the LinkedIn has done such a good job. Um, Motherly has done a really good job of this. And there was one other company that I can't think of it will come to me. But but talking about putting mother on your resume, some people say do it, some people don't. It's been a huge debate within my community. Um, I am on the fence about it. I think if you have that career gap, you can address it simply, you know, address it as stay at home mom, and then more so address it in the interview itself about how powerful it is to have the skills that you've been taught as a stay-at-home mom because mm -hmm. they yeah. are I mean far beyond what you can be trained at yeah and they're the work. toughest little managers yeah. we've ever had yeah. <laughs> right. yeah and a lot of moms are doing things not paid work but all kinds mm -hmm. of work that is still skill building exactly yeah. it's just not a paycheck that comes every other right week so I think there's so many niche positions out there now that women can really take a step back and say what do I want to do what do I care about what do I want to wake up and get excited about yeah. mm -hmm. and that's what they should be going for not oh I used to be an ultrasound tech and so I need to go back and be an ultrasound tech I mean hey if you love it right. and you're excited to get back go for it go but for it. You know, if you're not feeling that fire in your belly about it, this is the time to say, OK, you know, corporate America is upended right now because mm -hmm. of everything, the women movement, the pandemic, flexible work from home or, you know, remote hybrid options. There's so many things out there that mm -hmm. don't put yourself in this little tiny box because of what you used to do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, we talk about I that so that much. I love that idea. And for those of us who have been out of the workforce for a long time, you know, we hear about the great resignation. And you know, so that I feel like has now been 
not replace, but as far as the buzz term now is this quiet quitting. And there's all these things going on out in the workforce that impact us in the sense of like, when we do want to go back to work, it's offering maybe some flexibility. It's shaking things up a little bit and making things a little more interesting for us. But now there's yeah this quiet quitting that everybody seems to be talking about. Mm -hmm. As far as I can tell, it just seems to be healthy boundary setting. But I know that you've done You've shared a lot of articles and pieces about it. So do you have any insight onto quiet quitting besides what is that besides just women just saying, uh, no, I'm not going to no. work until 10 every night? <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, it's ironic because my husband and I, I debate this a fair amount, especially when I was writing a lot about it, where he is a manager and he completely disagrees with my perspective of quiet quitting. Because oh, he thinks of it as lazy, you know, mailing it in. They're just doing the bare minimum. Uh -huh. And that's what a lot of people think. That's what I think a lot of managers think. So I disagree for a few reasons. I think quiet quitting, as you said, is creating healthy boundaries, I think. And I don't know if I should be saying this on a public podcast, but <laughs> I called him out on it as, his, as the manager. I said it's a, a default of poor managing that people are getting excited about things. That was a separate conversation. <laughs> but ultimately, it's people and not just women setting boundaries around what they signed up to do and their home life and not letting that bleed into the other as much, in my opinion. A report came out that I think about 50% of the U.S. workforce is quiet quitting right now. And wow. I did say that I am calling total BS on that. I don't think they're using the term properly. I think what's happening is that these people are burnt out. They're not quite quitting because they're quiet quitters. They are doing it because they are self preserving. Mm, yeah. Yep. And, and they can't do anymore. Something's got to give. And they're like, this is what my job is asking me. This is all I have to give because I have so much else to deal with on this other side. So I don't think that's really fair to say that 50% of the U.S. is quiet quitting. And with that said, I think managers need to evaluate that and say from a leadership role, okay, all of my employees are burnt out. Work-life balance doesn't look good. What yeah. can I do what to do? help my people perform better for me? Yeah. yeah. I think collectively we have been through this really traumatic several years and longer, depending on where you're coming from. But mm -hmm. it's we've been through a lot. Our country has changed a lot. The world has changed in drastic ways. Our work and home lives have been impacted in so many ways that we don't even really even see them all yet. People are exhausted and stretched. So I like that distinction that you make between is it quiet quitting or is it self-preservation? And there's probably some overlap in there, mm -hmm. but it's not a laziness or I don't want to do this. It's not an attitude thing. It is truly like, in order and it's to not survive, always an employee thing. To... It's an, it's a management, it's a company Correct, thing. Right. Um, right. There's, they need to take a little look in the mirror at themselves this far. Yeah. yeah. Well, and what how, are you asking how people how to do? This? Yeah. Yeah, I think the study also said that truly it was a very small number of like 5% of quiet quitters are are like true, quote unquote, lazy, here to be a quiet quitter yeah. type of employee. Right. Like super, like this is, this is what I do. No matter mm -hmm. what company I'm at, this is kind of my baseline. Most people are not like that. They want to perform. They want to do well and excel and progress within their company. And so it's really more of a symptom of poor management or yeah. a symptom of a glitch in the company that needs to be addressed. Yeah. If roles yeah. are developed that require 60 hours a week and people There's are like, problem. no, I can only do 40 now. I mean, yeah, it's just A plus B is not equaling who knows what. <laughs> so. And right. I would say overwhelmingly when people go to work somewhere and start a job, they're excited about it. Yes. And so if they start excited and suddenly are finding themselves in a quiet quitting situation or setting a boundary, of preservation, setting mm -hmm. boundaries, well, we should look at the reasons mm -hmm. and there's more to it than it's not lazy people. I like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. It's not lazy 
There's yeah. not that many lazy people out there. <laughs> no, sure, there are some, but that's <laughs> not what it is. Now, I'm glad to hear that I'm not the only one who's like, wait a minute, you're oversimplifying it if it, you're just saying that the employees just are quitting or trying to do the bare minimum. There's, yeah, there's a, yeah, other they stuff. They want to work and they want to make money. I mean, mm-hmm. people need to earn a living and oftentimes really love the way they earn a living. They just don't love the environment. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'm so excited we're going to have a chance to talk to Kimberly about yeah. the stuff that she's doing. And I, I want to hear her story about how y'all met. So yes. <laughs> so for people who are excited yeah. about to continuing to hear your podcast, first of all, they should probably go give it a listen. So where's the yes. best place for people to go check you out? So we are streaming on almost all streaming devices. So um, Motherhood and Career Glide can be found on Apple, on Spotify, you name it. So that would be the best way to search for us there. Um, you can also go to my website, workingmomnotes.com, and I have a podcast tab. And you can also peruse there. I have a private forum that is free, and women can sign up for that. And there's lots of different topics of discussion, and they can ask questions. And it's more anonymous where you can create a username and really ask questions that you don't want necessarily to be public on Instagram or Facebook. And women can have more of an intimate conversation with each other about what's going on in their lives, whether it be, you know, husbands traveling and how are you juggling being a single working mom or, you know, I'm looking for a raise or I'm pregnant and up for promotion. When do I tell them, you know, questions like this much more intimate. And it's really been fun um, being a part of those discussions and moderating them. Yeah, that is really, oh gosh, that's just a whole nother treasure trove of questions that we need to, someday we'll have to ask those questions again about getting raises. Yeah, the anonymous, that kind of reminds me of the scary mommy. Remember when they used to have, or I think they still have it, the little anonymous I think they do still have it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is, it's nice. It offers a layer of protection where the women feel like they're able to be a little bit more transparent about their feelings because- they're anonymous essentially yeah but and then they can still the the forum is great because you can actually dm each other within the forum so you can connect and actually like reveal each other's identity if you felt comfortable or you can network so we have some job postings within the forum it's really great it's really a fun fun place to be oh so cool awesome all right everybody yeah. and then of course what's out. your instagram handle for everybody you have such a fun instagram account too Thank you. It's Working Mom Notes. Basically, everything, you can find me everywhere on Working Mom Notes, whether it be Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook. Um, If you are in New Jersey, please join the private community, Working Mom Notes, New Jersey. Otherwise, you can follow the public page on Facebook. Where else am I? Etsy. Some of my most popular quotes are printable for work. For women who maybe a baby shower, a work baby shower, you can print them and frame them. And they're they're great to give out as gifts for coworkers. Good. Yeah. Love that. And again, Our... working mom notes on Etsy. Yep. Everywhere. Everywhere you want to go. Just Google working that mom. That's easy. Yes. yes. And we'll have all the links in the show notes for everybody too. And I think right. with that, it's just about time for Look, Listen, Learn. It is. Yes. And for any listeners who are new, welcome. We are so glad you're here. And uh, at the end of our show, we just spend a few minutes talking about our Look, Listen, Learns, which are things that we're either reading or watching or learning about. Um, we don't want to put our guests in the hot seat first. So I'm going to have Missy kick it off with, uh, what do you Look, Listen, Learning? All right. Well, I looked at Hassan Minhaj, his new special, and he used to be on The Daily Show. I don't know if you know. Who yeah. He didn't is. he just get in trouble um, for something this week? Um, He gets himself in trouble quite a in bit. In a good and way. he had a show called Patriot Act, and he got in trouble on that all the time. He was always <laughs> making trouble. He talks about that a little bit in his special. Um, He is pretty political. But I also have the biggest crush on him. Like, I think he's so cute. Oh. <laughs> so I always watch everything he does. I but, watch his special uh, over and over. Yeah, exactly. Mark's like, I again. <laughs> but his new special is pretty funny. He talks about becoming a dad and the struggles they went through to become parents. And then he talks about the trouble he got in on Patriot Act, trying to make a point, a political point. And um, 
Then, oh, he was in the news this week because I guess he went on, or I know he went on Celebrity Jeopardy and I guess it was really That's what it was. That's what it was. And they said that his apology made it even worse because his apology was basically like, I'm sorry, you guys are just so easy. I'm sorry, you're boring. Yeah. (laughs) That's right. And they showed, if you watch on Jimmy Kimmel, we'll have to link it. Jimmy Kimmel does a recap of all of his... Because, yeah, he was just, like, yeah. so extra on Jeopardy. Like, I yeah. got some Very right animated. Like, it. boom! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they did, like, a it's... super recap of it, just clipping them all together. It was hilarious. And okay. Twitter went through, like, Twitter, Twitter roasted him. It was just like, this is the worst guest ever on Celebrity. What is wrong with him? What, is, oh. is this guy okay? <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to watch it. We watch have Jeopardy all the time as a family, so I'm sure we'll get yeah. through it. Apparently it was horrible. So yeah, that's why he was in the news this week. But the special's good. I thought it was great. And um, we watched in the same, we also watched Nick Kroll's new special. Oh yeah. Um, and I love Nick Kroll. He's very, he's also talking about growing up a little bit. Like it's mm-hmm. a theme for those two specials of growing up and getting married and being an adult. And I think not, it's not universal, but I think for many people in the comedy sphere, they grow up a little bit later. They spend their late teens and 20s really just working that scene and just mm-hmm. playing venues over and over and going up to the mic as many times as they can. So life hits later. Yeah. And then when it hits, they then it's a whole new interesting set of material for them. But uh, it's fun to hear about that because now they're a little more where we are. Who's uh, the, oh gosh, I don't want to just call her the blonde lady. She was just hosted SNL. Um, and- her? Amy Schumer. Amy Schumer. Yeah, I think of just, her as more redheaded, but yeah. yeah, I think about her the same way because now a lot of her material now talking about motherhood and career yes. colliding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Whereas all of her material before was about going out and having yeah. random freaky sex, and now <laughs> and now it's about babies. Yeah, and there's I a couldn't woman, relate to that as much. There's a woman uh, on tr- on Twitter that I um recently started following, Jenna Friedman. Uh-huh. She's a stand up comedian too, and she just had a baby and all of her tweets are just i mean they're they're not funny they're serious but about having a baby and having yeah. a, and like all the real raw information and she said like please don't follow me for this i'm going to get back to my content <laughs> but ultimately i'm like this is your content yes, yes. And I think yeah, there probably crazy. will be people when she goes back to it who are like, uh, who are you? But who then is this we person? all know that, I mean, it having the kid changes your DNA. I mean, yeah, you may go back, but it's going to have it's going to have a flavor of whatever she's doing now, I'm sure. Yeah. You oh, look yeah. at the world completely differently. So I love seeing that from public figures who mm-hmm. are now going through that stage. It, it's interesting to hear it. And of course, they're very funny. These talented comedians, so they bring yeah. it with some humor. Um, so that's what I've been looking at, and then I have been listening to Stick Season by Noah Khan. I think it's Khan. It's K A H A N. And one of his songs is like a TikTok trend, which is how I came across it, across yeah. him. Um, yeah. Embarrassed to say, but I like his music. Very good. So I have a goal to listen to something new that I've never heard of, and or I'm if I've heard of it and just never listened to it. Trying to listen to something new once a week. Oh. Um, because I, like I find that. that in our age, I tend to be like, this is my favorite music. And I mean, I tell my little robot overlord in the kitchen to play the same music all the time. Like I have favorite yes. cooking music and cleaning music and that kind of stuff. And I realized one day, like, I can't just cook to Mary Chape and Carpenter for the rest of my life. For some reason, I love to cook <laughs> to Mary Chape and Carpenter. And I love it. And I can sing every song almost word for word. And it makes me happy. But maybe I ought to branch out. I'm not yet 50. I've got a year to go. And by the time I'm 50, I want like a repertoire of new music. So oh, I can tell you it's too late now. 50 in a day. It's all over. It's all over. over. It's all over. <laughs> uh, so and then my learn is really dumb. But we had family pictures yesterday, just the four of us. Uh-huh. Hopefully for a Christmas card. And then Mark and I each got some headshots done. And I have multiple learnings. So I was, I'm not feeling great about myself. I have menopause weight, pandemic weight, broken foot, out of shapeness weight, and some laziness weight. Well, let's just be honest. Some of it's just I ate too many of the yummy things and didn't do the right things for a while. And so I'm not feeling that great about myself. And I went down this huge rabbit hole and I realized I was trying to find makeup products and makeup skills to basically create a different face. <laughs> I was like, how do I contour? How do I do this? How do I do that? 
And I, I caught myself because it was starting to like wrap me up. And in fact, the photographer is a mutual friend of mine and Suzanne's and I texted her and I was like, I think I'm your most neurotic client. And she was like, no, not even close. Yeah, I know. But I kind of caught myself and thought what, what Liz said, the photographer, she's like, if we're doing this, like I'm taking the time to be there, you're taking the time, you're spending money to be there. Just let it go and do it. Just do it. So I did, but I did buy a new foundation because I never wear foundation and I did want my skin to look a little better on <laughs> pictures. My foundation is usually just tinted sunscreen. That's what I wear every day. Mm -hmm. um, but I bought, a, I didn't want to spend a lot. It's a drugstore. I brought it in here. It's L'Oreal Infallible. And uh -huh. apparently it's 24 hour fresh wear. I don't know any circumstances in which I would have makeup on for 24 hours. Oh, I do it all the time. <laughs> I'm a, I am a compulsive face washer. Like this stuff comes off. I don't leave it on. Even my tinted sunscreen doesn't stay on. But I like it a lot. And you don't oh. usually like foundations. When I first goes on, I'm like, oh, it's a little, a little white. But it wears really well and it's light and it doesn't feel like having anything on. And it does have some sunscreen in it. I recommend still wearing real sunscreen. But my Very word is nice. that not all foundation is horrible. <laughs> I, you follow um, Bethany Frankel. She's been doing a, an entire drugstore um, oh, makeup yeah. review. It's incredible. Okay. I think that was one of her top foundations for the drugstore. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, okay. It's really fun. She's going through every single thing and she's like, this is a, a win. This is a no go. I love this. This is better than my designer makeup. Like she's going through it all. So uh -huh. that's definitely. Good. I need that. to go look at that because there I are some to, things. Yeah. I don't wear a ton of makeup. I like it. It's fun to play in, but I don't on a day to day wear a lot of makeup. So you don't want to spend a lot of money on yeah. everything. You know, I'm sending it to Zoe because once she goes to college, she's going to have to start like buying her own makeup. And she's going to be like, what? And she minute. loves to play in makeup too. Yeah. Oh, okay. What about you, Ashley? Are you look, listen, learning anything? So my big, I would say both the look and listen would be I'm really, because I have three small kids, I've gotten into Dr. Becky Kennedy's Good Inside, her book and her podcast. Okay. And they're like kind of complementing each other, uh -huh. because reinforcing, you know, I read and then I listen and then it reinforces. Yeah. And it's just such great information on parenting in general. Like she just gives you the scenario and how to handle it in a way. And the whole basis is that your your child is born good inside. So even mm. though they might have a bad behavior, they're still a good kid and you have to parent them that way, um, which can be really hard, you know, when kids are kids. <laughs> um, really sold me on it was I was listening to Glennon Doyle's podcast. And oh, yeah. She, yeah. She interviewed her and it was a fabulous okay. interview. That it must a, be where I've heard of her from because I think okay. like she's yes. familiar. Yes. I'm addicted yes. to Glennon's podcast. Yeah. Super <laughs> and Glennon said, like, I don't read parenting books. Like my kids are grown. I'm over it. I'm not I'm not doing it. But I did make an exception and read Dr. Becky's book. And it's literally applicable information even for me now. Mm -hmm. And that really made a difference to me, even with younger children, because it just seemed like it was timeless knowledge that yeah. it's good to have no matter what phase of life mm -hmm. my kids are in. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm, I'm like giving my husband all this nidbits. I'm like, you have to watch this. You have to <laughs> read this. You have to do this. The <laughs> Cliff's notes on it. Yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of my combo of the... Um, the look and the listen. I'm trying to think about the learn. The learn, similarly to you, Missy, is I'm just trying to learn to be accepting of myself through different phases of life, you know, mm -hmm. especially through this whole COVID thing and coming out and the kids and their new routine. And yeah, like you yeah. said, not taking a care of myself as I used to and really yeah. focusing on them. It's it's hard on your self-esteem. You know, you look yes. in the mirror and you're like, who is this person? I don't recognize that person. And I see so, pictures and I'm just like, that is not that, the woman who no, like lives in my head. That's not right. her. Yeah. It's like I look at old pictures of myself and I'm like, oh, there I am. And then I look at a mm. and I'm like, who is that person? <laughs> uh, I'm trying to accept that it's, you know, a natural part of life yes. and it's totally normal and okay to have these transitions. And 
I'm not derailed. You know, it can't be like a complete implosion moment because you look a little bit different during different phases of life. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to really, as I say to my friends, go inward instead Mm -hmm. of work so much about the outward and really make sure that I'm feeling good inside. Just like the podcast. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. See, I guess it's all like connected. I'm really good inside. Inside. Because I know once I do feel good inside, it'll start reflecting outward. Mm-hmm. So that's that's my learn. That's oh, a fantastic learn and good advice for all of us. Yes. Okay, <laughs> Suzanne, tell us what you are look listening learning. Okay. So looking at have you watched House of the Dragon yet? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it's the Game of Thrones like mm-hmm. prequel or whatever. And I should call it actually trying to look at it. It is so dark and not just in a dark like sinister way i mean it is like when we're watching it we have to turn the brightness up we have to tell alexa to turn off all the lights in the house (laughs) and then we're still like did you see someone move (laughs) we're like did they have like no makeup budget and so they're just doing half the scenes in the dark i don't know how to get away with murder was the same way i don't know if y'all ever watched that it was the shonda rhymes viola davis and it's good but I started it and was like, I can't, I can't do no. this. I can't, I literally can't see what's happening. Yeah, you and cannot see. And we, it started with one episode doing that. We're like, oh, well, it's kind of outside and it's dark and it's maybe it's yeah. symbolic or whatever. But no, now like a third of every episode, we're like, what? <laughs> we get it. The castles are dark, but. <laughs> Can you please light them for the show? <laughs> Just for the purposes of seeing it, we get it. But yes, um, and then equally dark, I have also been watching uh, *Handmaid's Tale*. Chris has refused to join me on this journey. He stopped well, at this, it yeah, at this season. He's like, it's just too rough. I was like, this is what it's like made a woman. <laughs> but but so yes, so that scary. has also been equally dark and leads me into my <laughs> listen of every crooked a podcast ever. So I, after the election. Whenever, whenever we finally went back to the sanity of Joe Biden, um, yeah, 2020. I made myself stop listening to all the Pod Save Americas and Pod Save the World and all those because I, mm-hmm. it really was. It was not feeding me in a good way. It was just making me mad and scared all the time. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I have fallen right back into it. I think whenever I'm feeling really vulnerable politically, I just go there just as my own little echo chamber to know that I'm not the only one that's circling this dangerous yeah. i don't know what it is so i have been listening way too much to all the pods and just please vote y'all i know this is gonna be after the vote so under his eye <laughs> i don't know <laughs> i told chris i was like depending on how the vote goes because i'm gonna be traveling with my daughter up to uh, rochester and syracuse for college tours and I was like, we might just boop over the border and just stay there. And, you know, stay. You, you can come for me in four years when things are safe. I don't know. <laughs> so there's a lot of that going on. And that's, and see, that leads right into my learn. So I'm learning what to do on a road trip uh, between Syracuse and Rochester. By time this airs, we will have had our Thanksgiving Encore episode of the mm-hmm. Thank You Project with Nancy Davis Co. And just happened to bump into Nancy at our friend Wendy's book release party yeah. for I'm Wearing Tunics Now. Oh, I should have brought the book in here. And it's on my nightstand. But it just happens to be that Nancy grew up in Rochester. So she's been giving me all the, the insider tips. Yeah, the insider <laughs> what to do. scoop. How far really apart are like Syracuse and Rochester? They are not super close. Um, it is probably like an hour and a half, two hour drive, I think. Oh, that's we'll not. Find out. Okay. We'll find out. I mean, it is going to be... We get into Syracuse at like midnight. We show up at the school at 8 a.m. And it's like full out tours, hour by hour stuff for their, because it's an open house, not just a tour. Oh, it's a yeah. big open house day. And then it's done at three. And then we get in a rental car and then we drive over to Rochester Institute of Technology. And we are going to do, they, they have an open house the next day. So we're going to do the same thing. We get there eight in the morning through the day. So it's going to be busy. In- it's going to be busy. It's going to be fun. I'm very excited. And yeah, she just has a couple more things. Uh, the Rochester Institute of Technology, a school that I had not heard of until a few months ago, is one of the few schools that has a medical illustration undergrad program. Which oh, wow. She has decided, sounds like, because like I said, now that she's decided she's 
pursuing this physical therapy. This is a degree that lets her get a lot of those prereqs, but also go towards a BFA mm -hmm. um, in this thing. And it has a really cool um, school for the deaf. And uh, Zoe has been for the yeah, longest she time. She that. She's proactively gone and taken classes at the Texas School for the Deaf. She's just really interested with sign language and being able. Her main thing is she never wants anyone to not be able to be yeah. involved or included. I love I, that. Did I ever tell you about the time she, over Christmas break, I'm sure I've told the story. Um, <laughs> I had to teach herself Portuguese because there yeah. was a girl that was moving to her middle school from Brazil and she didn't want oh, her to like not have anyone to talk to at lunch. So she spent Christmas break learning Portuguese. Yeah. So I think that's the same okay. thing with the sign language. But this uh, Rochester Institute of Technology has a whole, I think, 10% of the student body is in the School for the Deaf there. So wow. it just has so many things that tick the boxes. I'm like, how have we never heard of this yeah. school before? So it's on our list because it has a good um, computer science. Yeah. And so I'll be really interested to hear what you think about it. But it pops up on every list that my son's a year behind Zoe. Yes. Um, so we're just getting caught we're on that train a little bit we'll see if it, about it ticks her box for like being architecturally pleasing apparently it's like all red brick <laughs> there's a big joke i mean they all play it up about this idea that you know news from the brick it's all brick which who knows she grew up in circle c she's used to seeing a lot of bricks around <laughs> all these brick houses that look the same so that's hilarious yeah so we'll see but that's what i've been learning all right thank you so much for being here we know this is probably not the ideal day to record a podcast for you. So we really, oh, really appreciate that, it. No, I thank you so much for asking me. I know. And yes, I did have the stomach flu this weekend, but I'm feeling much better. So thank you. So glad. Then, everyone's getting sick. So, you know, I know. Check it's it off been the list. worst fall for sickness. Yeah. 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 We went to Chicago, the Broadway show last night, and I wore a mask. It's been forever since I've worn a mask inside, but yeah. It's so funny. My husband saw me do it because like there were, you know, people just kind of coughing. You know, you could just hear them, you know, when you're like, no. And there was one particular lady, probably about four or five rows behind us, but she just kept going. And I just like reached for it and put it on. Then my <laughs> husband reached for it. And put it on. He's like, I knew exactly why you were putting that on. I was like, yeah, I'm not taking that. So, mm -hmm. no. Yeah. My son just traveled for a debate tournament and I and had to fly. And I'm just waiting. Like waiting for the shoe to drop. <laughs> well, what oh, disease he brought us home? I yeah. just need to be able to get back from this weekend trip, and then yes, people can get their tummy bugs or whatever they're gonna do. Oh, God, don't <laughs> say it. Knock on wood. Not okay. in Rochester, please. Oh my God, please don't let us get sick in this. <laughs> <No. laughs> Uh, well, thank you so much, and we're so excited to meet your other half, Kimberly, uh, in the weeks ahead too. And. Yeah, everybody definitely go add Motherhood and Career Collide. Go make sure that you add that to your podcast repertoire because just I mean, if you like this podcast, the Venn diagram of like the things that you'll like about that <laughs> podcast is just like yeah. a circle. It's just so, For yeah, sure. you need to go check it out. Oh, All thank right. you. All right. All right. Thank, thank you, you so thank you. much. Have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us for the Mom and Dot 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 podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's show. And if you know someone else who could benefit from the episode, please be sure and share it with them. And while we're begging, please subscribe and rate us wherever it is you listen to podcasts. You can find links to all the things we discussed today in our show notes or over at our website, momandpodcast.com with the A-N-D spelled out. In between shows, find us over at the socials, including our private mom and community Facebook group. The links to that group and all of our socials can be found at mommanpodcast.com. Thank you so much for your support. We appreciate you more than you know. Now go out there and make your ellipses count.